treat me right Your dark hair because I Black and White Show here on Nova Radio North East 102.5 FM Well it's been another hectic week on Tyne's side As Newcastle de defeated Spurs this time last week They've also lost on penalties to Leicester in the League Cup on Wednesday but they took a good point yesterday, maybe, in an even game against Watford. We'll be discussing all of this in tonight's show. Berry were expelled by the EFL this week. What will be their destiny in the future to come? And what more needs to be done? We'll be looking at that later on in the show. And finally, we have Chris Woff here from The Athletic, who will be discussing his career in sports journalism and also be discussing Newcastle United at this current time under new head coach, Steve Bruce. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Black and White Show. We've got Lee Lawler, we've got Rob Spiel, and a big welcome to Chris Woff here from The Athletic. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much for having me on. Chris, it's it's always hectic in Newcastle, isn't it? But um, you've got you've got to say that it's just a typical week now, isn't it? It was, yeah. It was only at Newcastle could they go to Spurs and win, then play reasonably well against Leicester, but managed to get knocked out of the League Cup the first attempt, as so often they do go out of these competitions early, and then a sort of deflating 1-1 one, one draw Watford. I mean deflating in the sense of both teams. It was two average teams, really, and a draw was a fair result in the end. So, yeah, it was hectic, but also if you had told someone before the week started how the week would pan out, I don't think anyone would have been overly surprised. Definitely, definitely. Well, part one is about Tottenham, unless we're going to try and join these two together. We'll start with Spurs, Lee. Yeah. This time last week, we were, what time is it now? Six o'clock, we were probably biting our fingernails in the last 10 minutes of this game, but uh, what a fantastic win in Steve Bruce's first big win as Newcastle's head coach. What a day, never mind just the football, just what a day itself. People who are watching can see the stadium, I mean it's just, for me that's by far quite a distance the best stadium out there. Look, I think the win it enhances it, but I think if Newcastle could uh, scrape a point from that game, they would have you would have uh, run away with it, but... To get three points at their away stadium, it's going to be one of those moments, Johnny, where you look at it and think, were you there? Do you remember when we beat Spurs 1-0 in the back in the backyard? Fantastic. And the defenders, as Chris Mark Kamara might say, defended like Beavers. Um, but what a performance for me. That If something tops that this season, I highly doubt it. But for, that was just a phenomenal deal. Nothing will top. I can't say that personally. I can't say that getting beat. And Chris, it's probably was it your first time at the, uh, the ground last week? First time in the new stadium. Phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the old White Hart Lane, when you walked along sort of Tottenham High Road, you couldn't really see it, and then you got there, and it was, it was a famous old ground. It was cool, but it wasn't anything like this one. I mean, it dominates the skyline. You get there, the outside's impressive, and then inside, particularly that stand with the 17,000, the really steep one, what an atmosphere as well inside the I was very, very much impressed with that. I'm far more impressed than I have been with Wembley or other grounds I've been at. And then for Newcastle to win there, to really quiet in that crowd, was just fantastic. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was absolutely brilliant. I'll just mention that there have been a few games uh, earlier on today. Everton beating Wolves by three goals to two. Two goals from Richarlison and Alex Awobi getting his first goal for Everton. And Say Roman Saiz and Raul Jimenez getting on the score sheet for Wolves in an entertaining game. And it is currently 2-2 two -two at the Emirates between Arsenal and Spurs. Ericsson and Kane giving Tottenham a two-goal lead, but Lacazette and Aubameyang bring it back to Desmond. A two-two, if you know, if, if you know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it should be an entertaining last ten. And if there's any more goals, we'll let you know here on Nova Radio Northeast. Uh, Rob, welcome. Yes, thank uh, you very much. One 0 last week, Joe Linton with a yeah. fantastic finish. Mm -hmm. um, but let's give a little bit of credit to Christian Atsu because he doesn't normally mm. get a lot of credit in for his hacking threat defensively. He was a, he did well under Rafa Benitez last year which I'm sure we'll, we'll mention later towards the show. But a good assist and a great finish, and hopefully this is probably the start of him getting on the score sheet a little more often. Mm, oh, you know, that performance from Atsu, the assist wasn't the only thing. It was absolutely, you know, he came off the bench uh, in that first half. And, well, if he had it, didn't we? When yeah, I'll, went off. yeah I'll, I'll be honest. I was I was fearing the worst. I was expecting a battering. Then Atsu comes on, and I was expecting even more of a battering. But yeah, he came on and he really put them to the test and that's exactly what we wanted from him. He, well, he did everything and more that we wanted from him. And then, you know, to pan up Joe Linton and, and, you know, I think getting the first goal for the new club, especially £40 million price tag, the first goal is always going to be the, the hardest one that he'll get. But then, having said that, Hosselu scored in his home debut for us, <laughs> so... Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, really pleased with Joel Linton, and, and hopefully that's the first of many. Yeah, definitely, Chris. Let's just talk about the defence, and 
particular mention that Paul Dummett was man of the match, and I thought we, me and Lee were out, 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 obviously about the game last Sunday. We said Jamal Lasalle was was our personal man of the match, but Paul Dummett is he very much underrated in terms of Newcastle United's defence at the minute? But what timing? Because I've got a piece going up in the morning, basically talking <laughs> to Paul Dummett, also to Rafa Benitez and a few. Uh, other the likes of Jamal Lascelles and Fabian Scher about Paul Dummett and how underrated he is. For me, in terms of as an actual out and out defender, I think he's the best that the club have. I think that the, the balance of the, of the three at the moment works really well. Although I very much am looking forward to Florian Lejeune come back because I think he's an excellent defender. But for, for Paul Dummett, what I like about him so much is that he knows his limitations. He isn't the best going forward. He's not going to be an attacking left wing back if he plays there. If he plays left left back, he can be defensively solid. You know you can rely on him. He's he's very rarely going to put a nine out of ten or ten out of ten performance. Although at Spurs, I would I would put him in that nine out of ten bracket because I thought he was excellent. But he's he also very rarely going to dip into the threes and fours sorts of categories. So I think he's the, he's the sort of player who managers rely on. Rafa Benitez certainly relied on him. I think Steve Bruce said after the game that, that after the Spurs match that he was so impressed with everything he'd seen from Dummett so far so I really do think he's underrated but I also think fans are now starting to really appreciate him a bit more definitely Chris I think sorry Johnny I think Chris you've harshly marked me I think it was a 10 out of 10 for me <laughs> I thought he was sensational me same was, with Jamal Lascelles and Fabian Scherl all the back line were brilliant Lee if I give you the full centre half so like as in Paul Dummett Fabian Shaw, Jamal Lascelles yeah. and uh, Florian Lejeune who misses out oh. it Oof. It's a tough one because Paul Dummett had a good start the season again, and he did last season. I think he's much. Chris has already said. I think he's already much improved. I think Rafa worked on him, and he looks so much more. And, um, if he was English, would he be more committed to England than Wales? Probably. Uh, we all know he's English. He's a Geordie, but he plays for Wales because of his grandparents. But it's a tough one, that Johnny. I would, because of the the style. Right now, we'll keep it the way it is. But if all fit. I'm, I've got to get Florian Lejeune back on that side because you've got a ball playing yeah. centre back. You've got Fabian Shirt who bring the ball out, and then you've got your Jamal Lascelles. No nonsense, just likes him to clear it, mm. nudge his man off the ball. I think that works. Unfortunately for Paul Dummett, it's where do you find a position for him? I think it's a nice problem to have. I mean, it is. Newcastle, you, you look up front and you think they're lacking options in forward line, but certainly to a certain degree in, in centre midfield, but definitely at centre back, Newcastle are blessed with options. And I think any other team outside of the top eight. We'll look at Newcastle and think if we had those defensive options, we'd be more than happy with them. I think a lot of teams will look at that defensive options and go, yeah, we'll have some of that. I think that might be Newcastle's issue. Maybe in a January transfer window or in a summer transfer window, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, Chris, I'll let you go on a little bit about Steve Bruce because obviously there's a lot of frustrated fans when he was appointed, but you have to say tactically he got a spot on. And I, I said in my review at the end of last week, I th- the biggest compliment I could give Steve Bruce was that was a very much a Rafa Benitez type performance in, in, in terms of the defence side of things. So you've got to give him as much credit as possible, haven't you? You have to, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of said a similar thing in my analysis piece last week and there were some people who said that that was unfair on Bruce and that I was detracting from I, I wasn't meaning to do that, but all of the comparison in the first two matches was about how it wasn't like Rafa Benitez at Norwich City, the way that Newcastle were completely taken apart. But a lot of then you have some people saying that but he's just copied Benitez's system. He's used a system that works, but to, to manage to change Newcastle from how they were at Norwich in a week to get them as defensively solid as they were the week after, that is down to Bruce, the coaches and the players and the work they did that week. And they deserve all credit for how they did that between Norwich and Spurs. And I think that he thought about it, he realised the system he changed, it wasn't working. And I've been really impressed with how he has reacted to that. And just hopefully it works long term rather than just being a one-off at Spurs. What Newcastle have to do is make sure they consistently perform like that. Oh, definitely. And obviously we spoke to a couple of Spurs fans after the game, Lee and Tours, they were going to have their size clip on and an audio clip very, very soon. But you could just tell it was just general frustration that they couldn't break our defence down. And that was just, it was really good to see. Well, we, we said to them again, that these are the teams that they should be beating. If they want to go on and win the Champions League, again, finish in the top four, because I think Man City, Liverpool are, are, are a street ahead of everybody else. Mm. They have to be beating teams like Newcastle. And the draw at the moment with Arsenal, they might come away with a point, three points, they might lose that game, but they should be beaten. I know we played absolutely phenomenal defensively, but there was a start where Harry Kane only t- touched the ball 24 times, whereas Joe Layton touched it 40 that tells his own sto- your own story if you're keeping Harry King quiet and you've got Eric's on the bench. A lad's done phenomenally. Well, let's hear from Cy from We Are Top and TV with his reaction from last week. 
Look, Newcastle defended well. We always knew they were going to come back and, def and you know, sit eight men or nine men behind the ball. It's always going to be a counter-attacking display. But to be fair, you got your tactics spot on, and those your centre backs, uh, Lascelles and Fernand Fernandez, came on later. I'm not sure who else you have at centre back, but they yeah. they played really, really well. There were every cross that came in the box, they gobbled it up like meat and drink. And you got to give them credit. I think what was frustrating from my point of view is we gave you a one-nil head start with a real poor goal. I felt we gave away Sanchez just falling asleep, and your striker Joel Linton, who gave us no end of problems. I throughout the game holding the ball up or not he put he puts the ball in the back of the net and to give you a 1-0 head start is always going to make it 10 times harder to come back and the fact that we did that really really irks me but you know you've got to give Newcastle credit they haven't had the easiest starts of the season you boys to get together like that and pull off a performance um that defensive display like that away at Spurs you've got to give them credit you have got to give them credit but Rob how much credit do Newcastle deserve um defensively couldn't give them any more credit. They were absolutely brilliant. You have to say that when you lose your rock at the back in Lascelles in the last 10 minutes, sort of fearing the worst, but Federico Fernandez came on and he did exactly uh, what was it, uh, what was ordered from him. Because let, let, let's just face it, we we were never going to score again in the last 10 minutes. We, we were never going to score again. Um, you know, Joe Linton was off. We were looking really lethargic, tired. And th this can be what, Initially separates, you know, the the big team, the top six from the rest. Is right. that top six teams can last very much? Well, they're the all whole professional. Minutes. They're all professional athletes. So mm. I just think that Newcastle run themselves down. If you, down, if you think about the injuries so that we look had, at Joe, look at Joe Linton. The injuries that we had, the amount of muscles cramps that we were. We uh, picked up had, a few. I'll give you that. It it, it shows that. <laughs> We don't seem to be the fittest, or you know, we don't seem to be Premier League quality fit uh, going into this new season. Um, Tottenham, on the other hand, you know, there's a reason why they're in the top six. But you know, but then going up front, you can't help but feel that yes, we took our chances or chance uh, when it came to you know playing in front of goal. We had more shots on target than they did, I believe. Double, yeah, yeah, double. So that 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 shows that you know we long, long staff, long ranger. I know you could put that down to Tottenham being very profligate, but you got to give us credit as well. You know, Longstaff's uh, have a blast in the first half. That was on target, put Louise to the test. And then, of course, Joe Lint on, you know, clinical in front of goal right when you need it. Definitely, definitely. Let's move on to the Leicester game on Wednesday. It was the all-Premier League tie of the second round, which I find confusing, to say the least. But anyway... Newcastle lost 4 2 on penalties after a 1 1 draw on the night. James Madison's free kick. And a very, has to be said, it was more or less a first string team for Leicester and a second string team for Newcastle, it has to be said. But Leicester got the lead through Madison and Moot equalised. Josh Norman Moot remember him. He equalised in the second half after Dretro Valens. I don't know what he tried to do, if it was a dive or <laughs> an assist or give him something from that. But it was, a, it was a good finish, to say the least. But it was also a start for Matty Longstaff, Sean's brother making his first start in a competitive game for Newcastle as well. Chris, the Cups were meant to be a priority, but when you have so many injuries like you do against Tottenham and then playing Leicester, who I think Leicester probably would have gone in his favourites going into the game at St James's, was the Cups a really a priority? Well, that was my frustration, is that we've heard from Mike Ashley this summer, we've heard from Lee Charney in the programme notes before the Arsenal game, we've heard from Steve Bruce repeatedly that the Cups are going to be taken seriously and that they're actually targeting winning one, not just getting far in one, trying to win one. And for, So that was where my frustration came with the team selection on Wednesday is that it was it went counter to everything we've heard before. Now I understand all of the issues, I understand all of the injuries, I understand the importance of the Watford game, I understand they played Spurs on the Sunday, but the first opportunity Newcastle had to really show that the Cups have changed and their approach to the Cups have changed and they didn't manage to do it. They went out, yes, they played okay, Offensively, I didn't think they were that effective. Yes, they scored through Moodle, but they didn't really do much else. Leicester were poor on the night and they went out on penalties. They were unfortunate to a certain degree, but the reality is they are out of the cup. And for me, that, that was the big disappointment. You take away the performance, you take away all of that. I just think if it had been a Premier League game on Wednesday, I'm convinced at least one or two, probably three or four of those players who missed out would have played. Suddenly, that a lot of them were back for Saturday. They had niggles. The fact that Lascelles and Dummett were on the bench as well, if they're fit enough to, to be on the bench, and Dummett played 45 minutes, if they're fit enough to do that, for me, I would have started them if the cup is the priority. Benitez didn't take the cup seriously, but he didn't make any secret about the fact he wasn't going to do most of the time. That, for me, was the issue with Wednesday. Oh, definitely. 
Um, I've got to agree with him, by the way. Mm, I think if you want to progress in the Cups, start your Dubravkas. I know Matty, Matty starting was great that we're seeing local lad, but why isn't Key starting? He's on the bench. So there's a few that you can name, and I would go with the strongest side. And obviously, disappointing that we've got, we'll have to wait for another, well, I'll say FA Cup run. It's not really. I think the third round or the fourth round is our final, <laughs> isn't it? Nowadays, I can't remember last time Newcastle in the fifth round. I think it was probably when Keegan was here. Yeah, it was, it it was, was pre Ashley, so. 2005 or 06. Something like that. Got to the quarter final. Wow. Well, that tells you that tells you everything in itself. So I think you can make your own mind of whether the cup is a priority this year. But um, you've touched on Matty Longstaff, Lee. Um, how impressive was he? Was Did he did he do something a little bit different than the other midfielders that we've got on the, um, on the squad at the minute? I think Bruce likes them, first of all. He likes both of them. Uh, it's always great for a fan to see your Jordies coming through. So he seems to be a little bit of a clutch now. We've got Andy Carroll has come back. You've got the Longstaff brothers and Paul Dummett as well. Um, I think he started bright. He was doing a lot of chasing, though, in the first half. I think he feared a little bit second half. I think that's just because of tiredness. But if he's been training around the first team has been amongst it. Bruce has got plans from him. I'm pleased he didn't go out on loan because all of us in the summer said, you've got to send him out on loan. You've got to send him out on loan. We all said that. But is he at the level of Sean? No, he's probably, what, 12 months, maybe two years behind. But he's training with the first team and all we want as fans is Jordy's coming through, representing us. Also for the club, and I hate to say this, but it's a sell-on value for them. Yeah, it's not good to hear that, but... It's reality, it's the reality, yeah. yeah. When you look at it, Rob Sean... Sean Longstaff was rumoured that the roundabout fit, well, was rumoured fifty million pounds would be a, a minimum price, but mm. that never obviously came to the table for Manchester United. But I see Perez played for Leicester, Rob, and <laughs> it was a mixed reaction. Yeah, it was. Yeah, least, that um, was interesting. Yeah. What did, what did, what did you make of that? Would you? What did you do? Did you clap? Did you not clap? Did you just stay silent? What? I I wasn't clapping. I wasn't clapping. I'm not the biggest fan of him. Because whenever he got onto a decent run of form whilst he was in a Newcastle shirt, he was he would always be quick to say, "Ah, oh, but I want to go back to Spain. I want to leave the club. You know, I don't I don't want to you know stay and be a legend here." It's, it was always, "I want to leave the club." Um, was that go, a tactic to get a new contract though? Ma- uh, mainly to go back to Spain and for him to move eight hundred uh, like eighty miles south to Leicester instead of eight hundred miles south back to Spain. That hurt, that hurt. Certainly a team that, you know, let, let, let's be honest, Leicester are that little bit better than us. They've got that little bit more quality than us. Um, He's moved for ambition, that's what he said, didn't he? Yeah, I, I can understand that. But yeah, with, with, with Perez, I, 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 wasn't, I was booing, but I, but I wasn't doing it really loudly. But I, I, can't, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say, I did enjoy... Him, you know, Hayden having him for breakfast uh, on a number of occasions. And then there was that time when, you know, Leicester were hitting us on the counter. Perez had the ball. It was like 4-1-1 in four the second two, half. Yeah. And then he went, he greedily went for goal himself, blocked by Fernandez, And that 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 was a, a really good moment for me. Um, it wasn't a good night. And I think Leicester fans certainly learned the hard way that, you know, Perez never turns up in a season until about December. Chris, what do you make of Ayers and Perez? Because I think Rob's been quite scathing of him. Um, do you feel that, yes, he probably left for ambition, but if we're being brutally honest, do you think if Rafa Benitez was still the manager, I think he'd still be in a black and white shirt regardless of ambition? I think there's certainly more of a chance that he would have stayed. I think that that would have se- seemed to him to have been the club showing more ambition and he wasn't convinced of one. The contract situation that Lee brings up is, is interesting because Perez went in the final two years of his deal and Newcastle hadn't managed to get him to sign another one. I don't think talks were ever too far advanced, and yet he was one of their younger players, some that they brought through, having signed for a minimal fee, and you just thought, well, why haven't you tried to time down? I know he can be frustrating. I know he wasn't always scoring repeatedly, but when he did score, he went on purple patches, and he was important, and I think he was important in the dressing room. So for me, I always saw him as being a little bit underrated, but I can also understand why fans got frustrated by him and really £30 million was, was a good price for Newcastle. The issue for me is just they didn't replace the experience there. They definitely, they, did, they brought, obviously brought in players to obviously to try and recoup their, from the Perez money but obviously time will tell whether that will work to Newcastle's advantage it has to be said. Maybe we'll have to give it a season at least. Let's hear from Kyle. Um, he had a bit of a moan has to be said about Newcastle and their cup runs and their priority for the Cups over the league. So let's hear what, you have, let's hear what we have had to say 
If I said to you at the beginning of the night, this side's going to take Leicester all the way to penalties, you would have laughed at us. You would have done your laugh. Well, <laughs> that was that laugh you do. After, uh, after, <laughs> after around 20 minutes, I honestly thought it was going to penalties because of how boring the game was. But um, looking at both lineups, I thought Leicester would have run away winners, mate. So, the although, we, the although we've lost by penalties and as heartbreaking as, as it is, there's plenty of positives to take because we're rotated side, took a, what is probably a top eight, top ten side to a... Possibly top six, never know. Top, Everyone's favourite. Top, top six, uh, the dark, ho dark horse for top six, it, it, if they have a good season. So, to take them to penalties is, I suppose, as positives to take. But, yet again, a second round of the cup, it's not, it doesn't really matter about the result, does it? I mean, third, it's all about getting se through. second, third round of the cup, we just kind of seem to get through them, and it's just heartbreak, man, because you want to see a good cup run, man. We haven't, we, uh -huh. we haven't even had a smell of Wembley. The closest we've got to Wembley is a tourist attraction when Tottenham played there. That's the closest we've got. I mean, Sunderland's played there, Watford's played there, Brighton's played there. We haven't made it past the second round in three years. It's, it's embarrassing, late, to be honest. We should have done. But this is the, the, the draw that on, we got. On, on Everton, Everton or Leicester, you, you would just on, didn't on, want those two. On the, on the basis of tonight. The point in it, that the, was the league game. The team that we got drawn against was probably one of the hardest we could have been drawn against. That but, or Everton. But in the bigger picture, Lee, for us not to get past the second round in a couple of years is, is embarrassing. For the, We're running the FA Cup, speaks for itself as well. I think we've only got past the, uh, the third round twice since Mike Ashley came. The bigger picture, Lee, it's Mike Ashley, the lack of ambition. It's just sickening, to be honest. And How many more years we're going to go without a, a decent cup run so we can just go back and say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give the cup a good go this year. I think that's obviously going to be debated if Newcastle get knocked out with the third round of the FA Cup or the fourth round of the FA Cup, it has to be said. But it has finished at the Emirates. It has finished Arsenal 2, Tottenham 2. Um, good point for probably both sides in the aim for top four, but maybe Arsenal will look back at it as a better point for coming back from 2-0 down. Aubameyang getting the second 15 minutes from the end. Um, let's finish off with Leicester. Um, Yoshinori Muto got the goal, Lee. Does he need more chances? Does he need more start instead of just coming on five minutes from the end which he did against Watford which we'll mention in part two. Uh, with Watford he should have scored obviously I know we'll talk about that in a minute when he but he was bright less I know he got the goal but there was talk obviously with the language barrier he seems to pick that up over the summer. Uh, I've seen him speak on NUFC TV and he seems like he can speak good English now so I don't know there's always seems to be someone ahead of him like Rondon it was last season now it's still Linton. He's not going to get ahead of John Lennon, not a £40 million pound striker. It's almost like the striker version of Steve Harper <laughs> when he was at the club, just sort of be, be the number two all the time. Um, but what is he? Is, is he an out-and-out -out striker? Is he a number 10? Is he someone to hover on the wings? Yeah. I don't know. When we see him, like, for example, away at Old Trafford, he was very, very bright. But do we see it enough? Not enough, enough for me. Chris, where do you think Yoshino Remote's best position is in a Newcastle shirt? I think he's best off a striker. I don't think he is a central focal point as someone up front. I don't think that that role works for him as well. I'd like to see him off Joe Linton. I'd like to see him in combination with someone like Almiron or Atsu behind Joe Linton playing off him. For me, last season, Muto, I think he came on a lot and, and sort of ran around and was busy, but without actually having much end product and doing too much, the language barrier was an issue. He has really worked on it. And hopefully going forward, now he's got that goal, gives him a bit more confidence. And if he can score in the Premier League, hopefully that just gives Newcastle another option because otherwise they are looking very light in terms of back up up front. Obviously, John Joe Shelby and Isaac Hayden missed from the spot. The man, obviously, Leicester would win through Jamie Vardy's penalty. Can anybody remember Newcastle's last victory in a penalty shot in a competitive game? What fans? Yeah, what? Away? Yeah. What away, wasn't it? Bigger draws? The oh, last one at St. James. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last one at St James's Park was Partizan Belgrade. Yeah, yeah, that was horrible, mate. No, well, last time in the Champions League. Oh, right. Heartbreak. Definitely a heartbreak. Um, my final part is the fact that Leicester played their first eleven, Chris, and Newcastle played a second string. You know, you look at Leicester's first eleven and even Newcastle's first eleven. I think they would have done well to get a one-one draw. It has to be said. When you look at the the, the amount of attacking threats Le Leicester have got, is it? Hard to see that a team like Leicester, no disrespect to Leicester, they're not the big six, but they're putting out so much quality compared to what we have. And you've got to remember Leicester were a League One team, a championship team, not a million miles, uh, not a million years ago, rather. And I know they've won the league, but it was a bit sad to see a little bit. 
It, it is sad to see. I mean, that, unfortunately, that's where Newcastle are at the moment. That's what's happened over the last few years. About ten, about a decade ago, 12 years ago, Newcastle were sort of in that bracket of teams who really were thinking about we could be in what was the top four then and since become the established top six. And Newcastle, unfortunately, have been left behind. There's been two relegations in that time. There's only been one top six finish, which was the fifth place under Alan Pardew. The rest of the time, they've been hovering in the round battling relegation or, or lower mid-table. That's the reality of the situation they're in. Leicester, they had the, the, the fantastic season. Obviously, it came out of nowhere where they won the Premier League. In general, though, they are one of those teams, along with Wolves, Everton, who you think they could break into that top six. They have ambition to go forward. Brendan Rodgers has said he wants to target a cup. But Newcastle, I'm afraid that the rhetoric's been that over the last few months, but we haven't seen enough in terms of action, to suggest that they can compete with those sorts of teams. And Wednesday was almost, for me, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You put out a weekend team, the whole crowd, I know the crowd was low anyway, it's the off a couple of competitions, but then everyone just thinks, we're not taking this game seriously. And even though they played all right and got a draw, for me, I just I just thought it was a deflating night all round, really. Definitely. Uh, four days can make a lot of difference at, at Newcastle United, it has to be said. Uh, we're going to go and have a little break, but in part two, we're going to be talking about Saturday's game against Watford, Newcastle getting a point after... Behind after two minutes, we'll talk all about Newcastle 1, what for one straight after this break. Hold me close till I get up. Time is barely on our side. I don't want to waste what's left. The storms we chase are leading us. And Trust, yeah. No, I don't want to waste what's left. And on and on we'll go through the wastelands, through the highways, till my shadow turns to sun rays. And on and on we'll go through the wastelands, through the highways.
toes till I get up. Time is barely on our side. I don't wanna waste what's left. The storms we chase are leading us, and love is all we'll ever trust. Yeah, no, I don't wanna waste what's left. And Some of the Huddersfield's defence in part two, I have to be honest. I, I think they actually got beat on the weekend, but I, I don't know for sure who they played. I think it might be Luton, but we'll, don't quote me on that. But we're going to be talking about Newcastle 1. Watford won at St James's Park yesterday in front of a crowd of 44,157. Official the, attendance. Official attendance. And I'm, I'm going to put my neck out on the line here. I'll be amazed if there was just a, probably just over 40,000 at the yeah. game. There were so many empty seats. Is that a worry, Chris? It, I think it is a worry. I mean, only at Newcastle could there be a boycott for a game and then the following game actually have a lower turnout, <laughs> which, which I thought was bizarre. But I think that, that what we saw there, because it was Arsenal first game, because mm. it was the first game of the season, there were a lot of fans who maybe bought on the day or you had some quote-unquote sort of like tourist supporters. I think that we've seen that there are more season tickets have been given up than we necessarily realised before. I think there's a lot of fans that... Look, you've got to take into consideration that it was Watford at home that... It's the end of the summer holidays, so some people are away, so that may have affected the crowd. But the, the hierarchy needs to look at this, and there should be concern, there should be thinking, how are we going to get these fans back? Because for me, apathy is more dangerous than anger, because if there's anger, then fans are still wanting to be involved. When it gets to this stage, when fans are deciding they're not coming, they're not coming. some of them may not come back, some of them may decide to go and do something else, some of them may, may decide to go and watch North Shields, or may go and decide to watch someone else. And Newcastle need to give supporters a reason that they've, they've They've broken that trust with them, with Rafa Benitez going, and they need to really give them a reason to come back. Otherwise, the ground felt flat, and if it is going to be that low crowd, then they're going to struggle to really get that atmosphere, because I think some of the more vocal supporters are the ones who've gone as well. well exactly, I have to 100% agree with that. Well, Lee, Watford started off with a very, very early goal, just after 1 minute 20 seconds. Slightly fortunate for them, it has to be said, with Tom Coverley's shot being deflected about of two people at the same time, pretty much. Oh, yeah. And it just fell straight into the path of Will Hughes, who loves scoring against Newcastle, and uh, who put it past Martin Dubravka, and it was just the worst possible start, wasn't it? Yeah. And now, because we've got that great win uh, against Spurs, and obviously Leicester game was one of them, penalty shoot out to lottery, but one thing you want to do is not concede straight away, and we did. Yes, and that's fortunate. It took it ricocheted a couple of times, and they scored, but... Um, yeah, look, I think on the positive is you've got like 85, 88 minutes to try and claw a goal back. That's the only positive from that. All. I wasn't too disheartened about it. Yes, it's a bad start, but loads and loads of time to pull one back. Definitely. And going through the motions, the first half, it almost it almost felt like a pre-season friendly at times. It was just like middle of like August. It was just kind of like, it was. yes, there was nice weather, but it was just very much, very... Uh, Possession-based football by both sides, it has to be said. But Newcastle got a goal uh, just before half time through uh, Fabian Shaw. I don't think anybody else has picked this up, but it, it did seem a bit, a bit of a handball from Fabian Shaw. I don't know if anybody noticed it when watching highlights or anything. But I think I, wasn't it Hayden? Yeah, well, yeah sorry, Hayden. Yes, when when the, um, when the ball gets played into the box, but it it just seems to be forgotten about and like VAR didn't even pick it up or anything. So. Have Newcastle got away with one there, Rob? Well, I think across all the games that there were yesterday, I think VAR had a day off when it was really <laughs> needed. Um, it was absolutely ridiculous yesterday. I mean, so, some of the decisions in yesterday's games, if they happened last season, I'd be saying something along the lines of, oh, I can't wait for VAR to come in. Um, but then it's now here, and yet it's not being utilised. You know, clubs are, I think the FA is spending so much money on on this VAR, and yet it's it's not being used when it's needed. Um, well, you talk about VAR, can... Rob, we got a wheel of one against Spurs. Yeah, I yeah. I thought that was a penalty, me. Well, I can see why it wasn't given. I can see why why the penalty wasn't given. Uh, because Kane, if uh, it was one of those things you needed to look at replays to determine it. Kane actually changes direction just so he can get a penalty, just so Lascelles can come in and foul him. Um, he's, he's gone. He's gone looking for that penalty. But yeah, for yesterday, the new handball rule. Well, I don't agree with it, but it's there. Therefore, you know, referees should should abide to it. I think VAR should have been used, and and yeah, controversially, 
uh, we got our equaliser. I saw several replays of it though there in, in the press box, and even with several replays, you can't. I, I thought at first it touches. Uh, is it Dawson's hand? I think it's Dawson's yeah, hand. Yeah. So I don't think you can conclusively say that it definitely touches. It, it maybe it does, but it's not for me clear and obvious as it has to be for Vaughan. I think that clearly they've set the threshold very high. I think that was the with the Kane situation last week. Is it? I think it probably was a penalty, but clearly the Premier League have gone for the view that unless it is clear and obvious and definitely is the wrong decision, they're going to stick with whatever the referee thinks. And that's why that wasn't given last week. And that's why I assume they let the Hayden one go yesterday. Because it probably was handball, but even having seen several replays, mm. I can't say categorically it was. It's like, it's like video reviewing in, in, in cricket that you have an umpire's call, don't you, yeah. that's taken into account. And I guess, yeah, VAR in this situation for football is is very much the same. I understand, I understand both views, but if you look at maybe Hayden's potential handball and then you look at uh, Manchester City, Tottenham in the second week of the yeah. season... Is, well, it, is, thinking, it, is it not just the same thing, Chris? Yeah, well, that's a, the frustration with it is the inconsistencies and how, I mean, that one, they slowed it down, you see it flick his arm, and I don't really think it changed the direction of the ball. By the letter of the laws, the way that they changed it, yes, that, that should have been disallowed, and yes, Hayden should have been disallowed, but for me, the way I would enforce it, if they are going to do that, is that if it is clear and obvious, if, it is, if, it's a, if it's something where you see it immediately and the referee's made an absolute howler, but if you have to watch three, four, five, eight, ten replays to determine... That, that needs to be changed how is that clear and obvious because the, even having had the replays you're still not sure then I think you stick with the initial decision that umpire's call if you like I think that, that for me that was the issue with it in the World Cup when it was used that it seemed that whenever the referee went across the side of the pitch he thought the onus was on him to change his decision I think it has to be that look we'll stick with the referee unless we definitely have to change it yeah, definitely. I like the fact that it was me and Robert managed to get some bit of cricket into, oh. that, into, into the back and white show. And congratulations to England. Chris, Stokes. do you like cricket? I do like cricket. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm leaving the room, yeah. Ben, ben Stokes, who oh, yeah. uh, obviously plays for Durham, but uh, fantastic. Came out as a Spurs fan. He did, yeah. <laughs> he did. Didn't like that at all. No. Um, Lee, Miguel Almiron had a great chance, has to be said, when Newcastle were 1 0 down. Is he literally just missing a bit of luck, or is this getting a little bit worrying now because he. He came in for big money, and it was a big statement by Newcastle at the time to get this player in, and still no assists and still no goals. How worrying is it? A little bit. I wouldn't say it's the being end all right not right now. Look, I think he hasn't got an assist or a goal, which doesn't help him. But the quicker the better. But the problem that that turns into the longer it goes on, the more he's desperate and he'll start to snatch the chances, which you don't want because they'd be more relaxed the more chances are that you'll put it in the back of the net. Um, but the thing is, though, he creates a lot of havoc for defenders, as I was saying on the videos that we were doing yesterday, is that people are pulling on his shoulders, people are pulling on his arms. He's a threatened defenders, don't know what to do, and they, they can't foul him around the edge of the box, otherwise we'll get a free kick. So, for me, that or he could just die, which yeah, is what he did against Arsenal. For me, it was picked up by Shearer a couple of weeks back then. He need to get close. I think he has improved on that getting closer to Joe Linton. But if there's a cross, maybe from the left, from Atsu, or Mankio from right wing back, whoever it may be, whipping the balls in, Almiron has to be bursting in now. He's got to get in. And I think when he when he does get our first goal, I think then you'll probably stay, see it may, be maybe a bit of a flurry of goals, one every three games, one every four games, whatever. I just think he needs that monkey off his back. I think he just needs to have something that hits off his backside and go in the back of the net. I think that's something that... But you wouldn't put it past them to score a score 30-yard world. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, it did seem that Newcastle improved in the second half, Chris, and obviously Isaac had another very, very good chance, a very good shot, rather not a very good chance, because it was a difficult chance, but it was a wonderful save by Ben Foster. Um, the first 20 minutes of that second half was more encouraging, has to be said. It was. I mean, I think the first half, the early goal sort of knocked the stuffing out of Newcastle, and I thought that they just failed to recover. They got no momentum at all. Watford took control of the game. Second half, Newcastle came out far better. They had a couple of early runs down the left from Atsu, and that sort of lifted the crowd, lifted Newcastle a little bit. And I don't think that necessarily they deserved to win. I think a draw was probably a fair result, but certainly they were the better side during the second half. There were more encouraging signs, but there wasn't too, there weren't too many clear cut chances. And I really like a lot of what Joe Linton's brought. I thought he was excellent away at Spurs, and I think his all round play is very good. My concern is that I don't see him getting in the box enough, but I also don't, to be fair, I don't see enough really good service from him. There's a few good balls across across low, across the area, but in terms of really attacking that sort of 12-yard area where he can come and head it, I don't think there's enough of that. So Newcastle haven't 
offered enough of a threat as a home team, you have to really take that initiative, and I don't think they've quite done that yet in either of the two home games. Lee, how much do you cast on this to Matt Ritchie? Because obviously we didn't mention it in the last part, but obviously he's out for two months with a horrendous challenge, it has to be said, um, by Chowdhury, I think it was. Yeah. Um, two months, He's obviously he's... He's, un- he's underrated, isn't he? He is, but effort-wise you can't fault him. And I think that might be what we'll miss, maybe defensively and against maybe a Liverpool we've got in a couple of weeks. I've said already, I don't think we're missing too much against Watford. I actually thought Willems did all right up and down that byline. I think Willems is now starting just to get his match fitness and getting up to speed. I think he's still a little bit sluggish, but I didn't think that we missed Richie too much. I, I, I agree with your point against the bigger sides when you're going to have to graft harder because we all know Liverpool are going to have... Well, Tottenham had 80%. I think Liverpool could have more than that. So it's going to be it's going to be park the bus, so to speak, and you want everyone running around, grafting, putting a tackle in. Yes, he's going to be a miss, but also getting up. He's, last season, he was the second most crosses in the league behind Didnia of um, Everton. So you take away that as well. He's a penalty taker. I know you can joke on, I don't get many penalties, but he does. We are taking a lot away, but then I think the break has probably come at a good time in terms of injuries. We might get Carroll back. Obviously, Richie's not, St. Maximum not, but I think the break's coming at a good time, personally. I oh, definitely 100% agree with that. Um, Rob? Yeah. When you look at Newcastle in the last 15, 20 minutes, they, they huffed and puffed, but it was Watford that really had the better chances uh, with Isaac's success, having a header, which was saved by De Braffian, and, and then another good shot, I think it was from De La Feo, uh, mm. who just had a shot just on the edge of the box, which was, again, well saved by De Braffian. Um so you have to look, it was, it was probably a fair result on the overall balance of things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think when you come from behind, you when you're trailing in a game, I think to, to get a draw, especially early on in the season, let, let, let's be honest, the, we're not going to, when the season's finished, we're not going to look back on, oh, it was the Watford game that, that has cost us, dropped two points there. Yeah, it is disappointing considering Watford hadn't even got a point going into the game. Um, and now, and now that we, we've helped them get off the mark, but we were trailing. Hey, we, we got ourselves a controversial equaliser, um, and then Dubravka, of course, with some heroics in that second half, keeping them out. That's that, that's what he does best. Some some heroics. The amount of points that we would have dropped if it weren't for him, since he's come to the club, it's you know horrendous, really. Um, so it's, you know, it's thanks to him. It's business as usual for him. Definitely, it's good to see that he got the monkey off his back when, when he was playing top and there was no last minute. How does it have to be said? But uh, Chris, four points from four games, or four points from two games. I mean, look at the last couple of games. Um, is it par for Steve Bruce? If we're going for maybe on a goal from point of view, is it, is it, is it probably the, the minimum that we would like to have hoped for in the first four games? I think it is par. I mean, Newcastle haven't gone about it the way we probably would have expected them to at the start of the season, if you'd have looked at it, you'd have thought, right, Spurs and Arsenal, maybe they'll lose those two between Norwich and Watford, can they collect four points to them? In the end, it hasn't worked out that way. If you'd offered Newcastle fans four points from those first four games, if you'd offered Bruce it, I think a lot would have taken it. Being out of the cup is disappointing. It's about building momentum now. They could be in a lot worse shape. They go to Liverpool, that's a concern. They've got some very difficult games coming up. The Brighton match in a few weeks really does look crucial to really just, just keep a bit of momentum going. But I, I think it's a it's a reasonable enough return. I don't think we could have expected too much more from those opening few matches. The performance against Norwich was alarming, but at the same time, the performance at Spurs was very encouraging. So Newcastle need to find some sort of happy medium between the two, be more consistent and really pick up the home form, because as of yet, they haven't won at St James's Park, which is what they're going to have to do if they do have ambitions of not being in a relegation final all season. Definitely. Steve Bruce and the, the hierarchy want Newcastle fans to come back to the ground. They need to start winning some home games, for sure. And that Brighton game, just in the three weeks' time, will be absolutely crucial uh, for both sides, it has to be said. Let's hear from Kyle from, from the first half. Uh, well, from, he was saying a very poor first half against Watford. Let's see what he had to say. We huffed and puffed, but we didn't blow the houses down, as Paul would probably say. And uh, the game ends in a dreary 1-1. I think going into this, it, if you asked a Watford fan, would they take a point at St James's Park? They would have probably took it, uh, considering we got the win last week at Tottenham. But what do I say to the straw? It's it's a bit of a disappointment. It's two points dropped because we had the chances to win this game. And we just didn't take them, unfortunately. I mean, Watford had a couple of chances as well. A couple of decent saves by Martin Dubravka towards the end, but... 
this is a game we really should have won. But if you look look over the game, the highlights and things like that, it's probably a fair result to be honest. Two very poor teams that are probably towards the bottom end of the, the uh, end of the table this season. Very poor teams that will be at the bottom end of the table. Lee, do you think both teams will be near the bottom of the table, or do you think Watford can probably pull away because they seem? I think Watford are in a false quality. position. I think defensively they're a bit shaky, but I think they've got enough going forward. They've got some quality players. You know, you talk about Pereira, you talk about Will Hughes, you talk about Decorey up and chipping goals. Uh, who else have I missed off as well? Deeney's out injured at the minute. Um, De- Delafeld, have I mentioned him? I think he's a talent as well. So I think they're... they're Danny for, Welbeck as well. Yeah, I forgot about him. I think they're in a false position. Mm-hmm. I think with us, it's going to be stepping on shells all season for us because I think we're going to be hovering between 15 and 20 all season. I think, I think what you might have to consider is that, of course, the Watford board are no strangers to the sacking culture. And yeah. so I'm thinking one point from four games. And international to, break. To, to add on to that, you've also got you know the disastrous finish that they had to the end of last season. The Watford board must be thinking, yeah, perhaps it's time for Gracia to go. And then, of course, a new manager, most of the time, you know, brings some sort of honeymoon period, which... I think certainly helped Gracia when he came to the, uh, came into the club. Yeah, it has to be said that I think what well, the I don't think it was their best performance of the season, but the fact that they've managed to get a point on the board, I think obviously gives it them might a bit stop more the stop them getting them sacked. Possibly, I think he's a good. I think he's a good manager. I just think oh yeah, oh yeah, I think games. he's good, but uh, it's you know sacking culture now. Trigger button, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite. You, you know, you see managers get sacked for sneezing in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's that ruthless. Uh, Chris Christian Atsu. Um, I said yes. It was my man of the match. I thought he was doing something I haven't seen a lot of him, and that was driving on at defenders and actually having a go. And I just think he might have got a bit more confidence, especially from that Tottenham game. Because I'll be brutally honest, when Alan San Maximan, if I pronounced that right, came off, I, we were I'm thinking Christian Atsu attacking wise doesn't give you a lot to lot to really uh, be worried about from a defensive point of view. But he did very very well yesterday. I thought. He did. I've, I've been really impressed with him over the last week or so, primarily because he's basically just come back from an injury, had no sort of pre-season whatsoever because he was at the AFCON, and he's he's come in and really hit form quickly. And We haven't yet seen the best of Atsu in, in Newcastle shirt. He came with it to England with a good reputation, never made it at Chelsea, never even played for them, didn't really do it at Bournemouth or Everton. And he came to Newcastle in the Championship, wasn't great all the time, had a few really good performances in there and over the last couple of years he's been a squad player. Benitez during the second half of last season was really impressed with what he was doing when he was coming off the bench to replace Almiron and start this season. I mean, whenever you speak to uh, to Atu as a journalist, he is one of the nicest people you will ever speak to, so he's great to deal with. And I just, I, on a personal level, I'm, I'm really pleased for him and I just hope that this is really the spark that he needs. As you say, there is, he does have a, seem to have a different dimension to his game. He seems to be taking people on. He seems to be taking on the initiative rather than going into a shell a little bit. And Newcastle are going to need that because they have a lack of experience up front with in the forward position. With Richie out of the team, Atsu's probably going to get more of a run given the lack of, of forwards in there. And I, I just hope that he, he starts to deliver and starts to add goals to and assists to his game. And just finally, before we go on a quick break, uh, Liverpool next up. Is it the worst place to go to at the minute? It's Anfield because 13 wins in the Premier League in a row. That stretches from last season, but they're the team that just nobody wants to face at the minute. Yeah, they're sensational, aren't they? Um, be good the out, but that's that's <laughs> about it. Um, maybe we can out sing them. That'll be the only thing that I can think of. Look, if there's not one, you've got to stop the other, and if you don't stop those two, you've got to stop the third one for me. No, so it's I can't see anything than a defeat. Unfortunately, I think it'll be quite similar to last last year where we'll try and hold them off as much as we can as soon as the first goes in. Then obviously seeing an influx of goals in the second half last season. I know Salah was uh, described as a bit of a dive on that one, but I cannot see Newcastle picking nothing up. I think it's one of them. But then again, we said that was Spurs, but I think Liverpool are another level. Mm. You're notching it up a little bit. These are the Champions League winners. It's a damage limitation job, it's isn't it? Trying, it's maybe, maybe it's. I'll be very surprised if Bruce goes and attacks them. I think it'll be very much like a Rafa esque part of the bus. See what you can get. Move on to Brighton, as Chris has already said. That's a bigger game. And also, maybe just use it as something like a training fact. Just use it as defensive factors, really. <laughs> we need Do, a lot of that. Yeah. Are you looking forward to that trip down to Anfield, Chris, or are you just? Thinking, just get this game over and done with, and then we'll focus on the rest of the season. Well, on a personal level, it's always a nice 
actual ground to visit, but in terms of on a professional level, in terms of watching Newcastle and wanting them to win, I do fear for them that Liverpool turned over Brighton yesterday and they're going to turn over a lot of teams. Newcastle's record there is appalling. Um, so it, it, for me, it would be damage limitation. And I think that Bruce has to go there with, the, with that in mind, as negative as that is. I just don't see any way Newcastle win. I thought the same before Spurs, but this is taking up another two or three notches because I think that Man mm. City and Liverpool are just so far ahead of the rest. In a word, Chris, who wins the league, Liverpool and Man City? So, to be honest, Man City is two words. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of yeah. a leading question there, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still think Man City just about. Just about. Well, let's uh, have a little quick break in part three. We're going to be talking about a very sad thing in football, and that is Berry Football Club being expelled from the Football League. We'll get everybody's views on that. Let's pick up this break. When I walk into the kitchen, you saw the look on my face, you saw the look on my heart to get out of this place. I seen something I've never seen before. When you put on the pineapple, we couldn't be friends anymore. Pineapple pasta, put on pizza, it's a fruit and Welcome back to the Black and White Show here on our Radio North East 102.5 FM. We've talked all things Newcastle United for the first two parts after three games in seven days, or six days even, with Tottenham, Leicester and Watford. But part three is a bit more sad, unfortunately, because we're going to be talking about Berry Football Club. Um, and obviously the fact that they've been expelled from the Football League. They'll have no league games this season. They'll have no, uh, they won't take part in the FA Cup or the, the League Cup after Sheffield Wednesday were given the win in the first round. 
Um, it's a tragedy, it's a shame, but who's at fault? And I think the first person you kind of got to look at is Steve Dale, the current owner of the football club, bought the football club for a pound, um, hasn't paid the, uh, the players for months. The PFA have had to pay, well, a considerable amount of the wages. And he came out in a recent interview for, I think, with BBC Radio 5 Live mm. and said that he doesn't really like football, he doesn't get it. And he Did he know where Barry was? No, he didn't know yeah. where Barry was. He just, I think he saw it as an opportunity that's gone horribly wrong. Lee, how much fault does Steve Dale have in Barry's tragedy, has to be said? He's got to take a large chunk the previous owners as well, as well as him. But for him, if you, if you, all you got to do is Google these businesses mm. and they've all went downhill. They've all went liquidated as far as I'm aware. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but that's the danger. But then again, the AFL for not doing the proper checks on him. Because if they'd done the checks on him, he wouldn't be the owner of Berry right now and they wouldn't be in the mess that they are in. And fortunately, the most people that I feel for is the people who work for the club, your cleaners, your tea ladies, people like that, the community and the local fans, and they those are your real genuine fans because you've obviously got huge, huge Premier League clubs around them within nine miles, and the fans of Berry who go to Berry games. I seen a lad on Sky Sports News, and he follows them home and away. There's only three thousand of us, but that three thousand is a community. And then he talked about the history of 130 odd plus years just vanished. You've got the businesses as well in in that vicinity of Gig Lane that rely on the income that they receive on match days as well. So. Other than the communities, it's business, local businesses that suffer as well. It's, a, it's like your pubs, your sandwich shops, like people yeah. like getting your yeah. food and all that. It is, it's, it's a real mm. shame. Um, one thing I would like to say is that why did he not just sell it for anything? If he's he's going to make a profit. He'd make a profit in terms of making the sale from the football club, Chris, and considering he's had to pay a pound. Has he just asked for too much or is he in so much of, of a financial state that he needs the right deal for him as a person. It, it was a very strange situation. I really don't know the answer to that question because, as you say, it, to me, it would have made sense to have, in the end, just, just flogged it for whatever he could have done because he only bought it for a pound. I think that the price he was asking, speaking to a few people in the route, sounds like it was too high and that people were thinking that he's just trying to make money for himself here rather than actually try and save the football club. But how it got to this stage, I mean, previous owners do have to accept responsibility. Clearly, they've invested far too much and tried to get very far too high up the leagues and they were paying way over the odds for, for the sort of levels they're at and, and that's the the issue of football at the moment at certain levels there are clubs who are overstretching themselves they want to get to the riches of the upper tiers but certain clubs have a certain level at certain periods of time you've got to have organic growth very clearly didn't have that it's terrible what's happening it, it's the supporters and those people in and around at least that's who i really feel for because supporters have had nothing to do with this yes Supporters ask for the club to invest more. Yes, supporters want the club to go on and, and be better, but they aren't the ones who actually make those decisions. You need a responsible owner in there. You need someone to look after that club. It is a community asset, and for me, clubs should be community assets. There should be something in place. I don't know exactly how you would get this legislation in, but this just should not be allowed to happen. Bolton, hopefully, have been saved. Bury hasn't been the same situation, and that is a town which has lost something that's vital a club that's won two FA Cups, a club that, that is historic in that sense, and suddenly they are going to go down and have to form a Phoenix club, and yes, they can come back, but it should never reach that in the first place. It has to be said that, you know, we, we all feel so sorry for the, the real Berry fans. That... Well, I'll tell you what, Johnny, if I lost Newcastle, I'd be distraught, and I bet mm. there's thousands yeah. of others would. Yeah. I mean, is there, when you say that football is like your religion, in some people's it is. It is your daily need, it's your daily butter, it's your daily bread. And just to take that away from their lives, it's a hole that's missing. It is, and I think you know we've had clubs in the past, like of Portsmouth, like of Blackpool, you know, have been very, very close. Leeds United, it has to be said, they were very, very close to being no longer Leeds United, and that's not a million, that million years ago. So it's the communities that we feel sorry for, Robin. Mm -hmm. You look at community clubs similar in the northeast, like of Gator, Darlington, Hartlepool. They've had these issues as well, big time. Yeah. How do they how do they recover from this? That's I think that's the, the big question. How can Berry recover from this? I think Darlington is a great source of inspiration because as soon as they were liquidated, they formed again straight away. And I I think I, I believe that the first se if I remember rightly the first season that they had after reforming, uh, they got promotion straight away and 
you could tell the whole town was, you know, I, I went to school with a lot of, you know, passionate Darlington fans. And, uh, yeah, the town was absolutely buzzing. Once they got that first promotion in their first season, once they reformed, once, you know, that as painful as having to reform was, at least they got rid of the poison. They were starting afresh. And, uh, and look where they are now, the Conference North, which isn't a million, um, it, it's not a million miles away from League Two. I mean, hey, Stockport were, were in that division last season. Um, so I think Darlington is, is a great source of inspiration for Barry, and, and of course we, we certainly wish uh, the Shakers all the best. The, prob- the problem is with what you mentioned there with obviously Darlington is a little bit different because it was George Reynolds, wasn't it? And he went in to, to go and that get... Was, yeah, that was the source of the problem because it... You want that, that stadium alone? I mean, how much is that? That that nearly that cost twenty five, thirty million pounds. Which... Tripled them. I remember Newcastle were playing there in a friendly. You know, with the uh, the Sammy scores were on the pitch, all of that. Mm. That was only a few years ago. Uh, there's a little bit different because they were he was push, putting enough. money where I mean, you kind of in League Two. Well, it would have been called the old back in the day, but in League Two, you kind of get a twenty five thousand people in, in through the ground. Well, funnily you enough, be realistic. Swansea's Liberty Stadium. Uh, was built whilst Swansea were in League Two, very similar capacity as well, and uh, they had the ambition of. Well, the thing is, George Reynolds had the so-called ambition of um, wanting to create a Premier League-ready stadium. Hence, the Darlington Arena was was built, and they, they had to move out of Feetums. That was a, that was a place that was kind of falling apart. Uh, so, so they had to move out of there in two thousand and three, and I think they they probably saw the plans of Swansea. And uh, they probably, you know, tried to take inspiration from that and tried to compete with, you know, let's not forget they were probably divisional rivals at the time. Yeah, uh, Chris, the EFL get a lot of criticism, um, especially on TV. As you said, when there's a, a, a league game now, it just seems to be obviously. I think everybody knows the chance, but do you think that the EFL could have done more? And do you think it's about time that maybe they scrap this fit and proper person says because it doesn't seem to be working, or they need to think of something else because. There's too many owners that have come in and have ruined football clubs at the minute. Well, the fit and proper person test certainly needs to be looked at. I mean, what concerned me was in the final hours before Barry Workspell that one of the, the people who came out who was supposedly one of the prospective owners was Joseph Caller, who I was described by a lot of people as the Gateshead owner. Now, my understanding was when he was at, was involved at Gateshead, he was adamant that he wasn't involved in Gateshead and he wasn't the owner, but you just had to look, have to look at what happened at that football club and that he's done elsewhere, he was at clubs in Italy, he was at other clubs in England, and that somehow he was he was going to be involved in, in taking over Berry. Would that have been a better situation? You, you just you can't really say that it would have been because of his past record. So clearly something needs to be done to sort out this who, who can own a football club. But it was interesting that listening to, and I don't agree with much of what he says, but Simon Jordan was on the radio the other day and he was talking about the fact that no matter what you do, no matter what provisions you put in place, you are going to have bad owners. If someone is going to run a football club badly, you can't always, no matter how many checks you put in place beforehand, you can't determine what's going to happen. And so, to a certain degree, it is out of the EFL's hands, but at the same time, I don't think that the current fit and proper person's test is working and there needs to, it needs to be more stringent and need to, to try and stop some of these people coming in and creating the situations that we've had the likes of Barry Bolton and elsewhere. You talk about Bolton, uh, Chris, but Lee, they got saved. And they got saved on Wednesday. I think maybe the fact that Berry got expelled, I think maybe accelerated a deal because it's it was they were given two weeks to try and sort themselves out. Yes, they're, they're still playing football, and yes, they've been taken over, but that's still going to be another 12 months where they're really going to have to get back on the straight and narrow because they say 23rd of the 23 teams that are left in League 1 on minus 11 points very likely that they might be playing League 2 football as the Bolton Wonders who are playing Atletico Madrid in the Europa League or the UEFA Cup back then. Bayern Munich, didn't they? Yeah, mm. and they, they, were playing, well, they were playing the likes of Sergio Aguero and beating the teams with Sergio Aguero in them. It's, it's such a shame to see Bolton that way, but at least hopefully they can get back on track. It is. It's difficult for them. I think, they'll, I think it's a huge ask. I think the target is probably what getting within six points, maybe New Year, because obviously they can't buy players. In the transfer window, that's probably the short and medium term, but long term, you are probably looking at maybe League Two football. But it, but the most important thing is that the football club has been saved, no matter what division that's in. Yeah, we've all got great memories of Sam Allardyce, and who would thought that? Have when, we? Well, <laughs> Bolton fans do. Sorry, I'll rephrase that before anyone before anyone gets in the comments of that. Um, 
But Sam Allardyce has done absolutely magnificent stuff at Bolton, and when unfortunately when he left, it all seems to go downhill. So you can talk about you know Ivan Campos, the Anelkas. I remember Kevin Davis up front, giving at the elbows and all of that. JJ Acocha. Oh, wow, what a mm. talent he was. Yeah. And obviously his nephew, Alex Awobi at Everton mm. now. And, you know, Hiero, how did he manage to get Real Madrid's European will, European captain, sorry, not world captain, um, come over and had a fantastic season. And Joe Kayef, the, there's loads of names that can go on. And it's a shame that they've went down the divisions and, you know, they've got a nice little stadium there. When I, rem- I remember it was the Reebok. Because I remember when they played, when they came up in 95, 96, and I remember winning 3 1 away to the old stadium. Ferdinand scored ahead of that day, showed me age a little bit. Um, but going down, it's a shame, but it's they're just one of many. You've already listed a few, I can name you loads more that happened. And I think for me, I signed a petition for an independent regulator, separate away from the PFA, separate away from the AFL, just to basically do those checks and make sure that those clubs are secure. There needs to be something because the AFL are partly at fault for all these clubs as well. So, yes, it's the owners, but the AFL need to step up as well. Definitely. We're going to hear from a Barry fan now, unfortunately, with his club now being expelled from the football league. Let's hear from him. I can't say much to them. It can't remain, but I can say that for the team, it's absolutely devastated. Um, you can see the effects online. Whilst it's a positive, I've never seen very come together as a community so much before. Everyone is absolutely devastated by the news. There was also so much hope going to the final day of there being a takeover, mm. but it just wasn't to be. Yeah. The fact is, you have a deadline, you have to meet it. And I don't think it helps that the ESL maybe the barriers an opportunity to make a point for the teams. Uh, they messed up financially. They ran themselves into the ground and made them see it as a chance to show the teams that this is not how a club should be run. Yeah. But the fact is, when you buy a club for a pound, you know you're going to be taking on a lot of debt and very hard. The only other thing is looking for that is for the players that are playing for the beast and they like to make that bitch and guarantee you they're not going to go all the way down it. It's clear that they have overdone themselves at times. Obviously, the Premier League clubs earn a lot of money, so when has small teams in financial trouble, especially with the teams who are big teams like Manchester United, Manchester City, people are saying, why don't they help? Or if they help every club that needed help, then it, you know, it, it just, they just have, maybe they could have done things in the future if they had succeeded in being taken over but they had financial problems mm-hmm. such as this when the these clubs are very and stuff like that That was a Berry fan Robbie actually know this Berry fan and he yep. managed to get this audio clip for us and I think you could just tell by the way he was talking about it it was it was very tough for him to talk about a club's not going to be playing football this season. Yeah, he's um, well. I knew him at uni, and um, he's lived in Bury all his life. Um, and he he said that the community are absolutely devastated, um, and and nothing short of it. Look, you know, we'd be absolutely devastated if you know it happens to to any clubs we've found out. It's it's genuine people, genuine hardworking people that you know go to work during the week and spend their hard earned money going to watch their favorite team and. Barry just can't do that anymore. Um, yeah, we. I couldn't bear it if, if the same happened to Newcastle. So hopefully, we can learn from this. Uh, sadly, it's it's in the past now. There's nothing we can do to to prevent it now. Um, but hopefully, you know, the EFL can make steps to the fit and proper test, review it, and so so that we don't get another Steve Dale uh, running a football club again. Well, we definitely hope that's not the okay. case. I hope that Steve Dale never runs a football club again. And it's, uh, you look at teams that we've mentioned, like Leeds United and Portsmouth, and how close they were, but I don't think we'd ever actually see a team get expelled from a, from the football league. So it's very sad to see. Well, that is the end of part three. Um, in part four, it's all about Mr. Chris Woff. He's our special guest tonight. He's from The Athletic. He's going to t- tell us about his career in sports journalism and how he gets to do the job that he loves. That is all in part four here on the Radio Northeast. East. on
Welcome back to part four of the Black and White Show here on the Radio North East 102.5 FM. It's been a fantastic show so far. We have got a special guest with us, and that is Mr. Chris Woff here from The Athletic. Um, he's obviously been covering Newcastle for a long time now. How long would you say you've been covering Newcastle, Chris? It's about four and a half years now, so I was at the Chronicle for, for about four and a bit, and then, yeah, been at The Athletic for the last two or three months since that they've launched in the UK. So, Chris, it, it all started from... 2009 going to a university in Edinburgh, obviously you were completing a history degree, but you did seem to do a lot of stuff whilst you were there in terms of sports shows and radio shows, and I've, I've, I've got here you were a sports show host um, in Edinburgh, and you also it was a Edinburgh student newspaper, and you were a sports editor at the, the student, is that student, what it's called? Yeah, student newspaper. What, what are your memories of that? Oh, I loved it a bit at Edinburgh, so when Great City, and not too far from Newcastle, and uh, so in terms of uni life, it was brilliant. But at the same time, when I was there, I'd, I'd always, since I was young and, and I loved sport and I was uh, the podgy kid at school, so I was never, I was never the, the most athletic or the best at, in terms of at, at football or rugby as I played as well. So I always had a thought of how can I get into sport without actually playing it because I was never ever going to be professional in that regard. And I, I loved writing about it. I loved talking about it. I loved listening to other people's opinions on it. So when I went to uni, explored all avenues and started writing for the for the student newspaper which is called the student and uh went and covered sort of local football there the rugby the hockey all those sorts of things and also gave my opinion on what was going on nationally i mean no one cared what my opinion was <laughs> what was going on nationally but i enjoyed writing it anyway and it, it filled part of the newspaper then they asked me if i wanted to be sports editor and that was great i did that for two years and so then i got to select what went in the newspaper same time i dabbled in a bit of doing it hosting Radio show. I mean, the radio show. Let's be honest. It, it was terrible. I was terrible at it. I, but but it was it was great fun at the same time because we were talking about what we wanted to talk about. We were talking about local sports, uni sports, general sports, and and that was great because it was just me and a few friends. But it, it also gave me that bit of experience. And in the times when I had, as you do at university, have a, have a lot of holidays, I went and tried to do a bit of work experience. I went to Hexham Courant. I went to uh, the Chronicle. I went down to London for a bit. Went to the Independent. BBC Newcastle, just trying to gain as much experience as I could and not only did it, I think I wanted to do it, having experienced it, I loved every minute of reporting and so it's what I wanted to get into. How important is work experience because I think if you ever get offered something, especially if you're at university, 
you've just got to take it. Whether you, whether it's the the right thing for you, if just to get your foot through the door, I think it's so important, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, very much so in journalism, but I also see in, in other industries as well. It, it's just so important for even if you end up going into another walk of life, the fact that you're in that professional environment, you, you're getting skills which are transferable. It, it is essential, I mean, certainly in journalism, to go and actually have see day to day how it is because it is different to how you may think it's it's going to be and that may put some people off and that in itself is important because then that will get you to rethink about the career you want to go for but otherwise you learn the skills that you need you you make contacts you just generally grow as a person and, and, and in a professional sense and so i'd say as, as much as you need to enjoy your uni life you need to you need to experience all of that you do have so much spare time and you can enjoy your uni life while at the same time getting the work experience in whatever industry it is you think you may want to go into, and certainly in sports journalism I'd, or journalism in general, I'd say any opportunity you get, take it. I think, I, I think that's, we've got a few people in this in this group that are very interested in becoming a sports journalist in, in some capacity or another. If someone wants to work in this field, if I was to say give you like three top tips into getting into this field, and you know, you've been covering Newcastle for four and a half years, so if they were to try and do something similar to that, what would you say your three tips are? First of all, one of them would be work experience, as we've already touched upon, that you can never have too much work experience. That just every everything and, and everywhere, whether it's writing for a website, whether it's doing something for a fanzine, whether it's doing something, going and just sitting in a studio in, a, in, in the local radio station, whether it's just going into a newspaper and, and spending one or two days there, whatever you can get, that is essential and it builds it up and it means that you start getting things you name publish, you start getting your name out there, you start building those contacts. So that would certainly be the first one. The second would be to consume every piece of media you can, read about what you're interested in, for, even if you want to specialise in football or rugby or whatever it is, read read the writers out there who are experienced and who are good, learn from them, learn techniques from them, think about when you're watching a game, if you just generally go on as a fan, think about why, if I was reporting on this, what, what would I be writing about? What, what is the key line here? What is it that everyone else is going to be talking about? And third of all, it's just, I'd say, it, it's approaching people making contact. So be that someone like myself, and this is not trying to be myself, but someone who's in the industry, get advice from them, go and speak to them, see just anything they can give you in that regard, whether it's message uh, someone at a local newspaper, wherever you are, a local radio station, speak to people on websites, just get your name out there and make sure that you, that you people realise it because opportunities will arise. It, it's a very difficult industry to get into and I'm not going to pretend that it's easy to get into it, but sometimes you need that bit of luck and if you've put your name out there, if you've been proactive, if you've said, oh, if there's an opportunity to do such and such, that opportunity might arise. If you don't, as we have the term up here, shy bands getting out, that is essential up here. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Lee. Obviously, you've been doing Newcastle Fans TV for such a long time. Well, it's, it's three years now, isn't it? Yeah, three, three years. years. It, is it's what Chris has done almost, you kind of look up to him in a certain, se a certain uh, sense because he's doing a job that he's getting paid for to come in Newcastle. I know you get... Give a, me your job, Chris. Your job. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, is it good to see, again, another term, it's good to see your local boys do well. And it's a good example, isn't it, really? I think you've got to have the love for it first, no matter what kind of media you're doing. Because if you just want to be in the, the industry to to get rich or, or get famous, you're not doing it for the right reasons. You know, if you're doing it for the love and you love that, whatever it may do, whether it's typing up a story, maybe it's going on camera presenting, maybe it's editing, whatever it may be, if you have got that love, that'll already push you to one step. I was laughing what Chris said because you were mentioning about when you're in a game and you're doing a bit of commentary because Rob does this all the time. <laughs> well, me and Rob went to um, New York. You know what I'm going to bring up yeah, here? Yeah, do, me, yeah. Me and Rob went to New York and we went to see the Red Bulls play and uh, the one, didn't they? The one, didn't yeah, they? yeah. And then um, Rob's doing a run of commentary next to me. He goes, Rob, what are you doing? He's just doing a run of commentary. He goes, I've really done the call and I take it over. And goes, Rob, what are you doing? Because I'm, oh, I'm, just in, I'm just in practice mode as well. Um, so it's great as well as a group uh, that we have people who do that uh, stuff. Like Rob is the commentator. I'm going to big you up now. Rob's <laughs> the commentator for York City. So I don't know if you knew that, Chris. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, I did. So, so you did. So you've done your research. We've got Will, who's... Um, Involved with Salford, does all the social media stuff. And Accrington Stanley. Is it? And now he's yeah. got the commentating job at Accrington Stanley, which is fantastic. Um, 
and they're doing it out the free time because they love what they're doing. And for us as well, we're doing this radio show for nothing. We do all the videos for nothing because we've got the love and we've got a few contacts here and there because we we relate to a lot of people. We we'll love one common goal, which is Newcastle United. So we like to get people on, like Chris, like Mick Lowe's we've had recently. We've had Lee Ryder on in the past. We've had uh, Hugo Viana, Kevin Nolan, and, and so on, Shola and everyone. It's great to get these people on because they can see that they look at us and think, these lads are all right. The fans, the passionate, they want to do well in life in terms of like progression, of course. We want to progress. And I can relate a lot of stuff what Chris has just said there. Uh, Chris, obviously we're at the Chronicle for, was it three and a half, four, sorry, four and a half years? Four, three, four and a half years. And obviously Newcastle... And the Chronicle, I think it's been a testing relationship, it has to be said, over the years. Um, this question's in two parts. The first is, how would you sum up your time at the Chronicle? And obviously you were there for quite a while. And do you feel that the relationship between Newcastle and the Chronicle could be better? Has it improved over the years, maybe in the last couple, maybe since the McLaren era? Maybe just before that, it was it was quite toxic, it has to be said. Um, what, were your, what are your just general feelings on everything? I absolutely loved working at the Chronicle Journal, Sunday Sun, NCG Media, Chronicle Live. That When I was growing up in the West End of Newcastle, I read the Chronicle, I read the Journal, I consumed all of that. And, and so to, to work for that organisation was, was brilliant for me. To, it's an institution in the city, it's important. I'm glad to see that they've, they've replaced me there and that, that, that they are hopefully going to go from, from keep progressing with what they're doing. And I understand that the, the industry's changed and there's been a lot of criticism of the way it's changed but for journalism needs to pay in some way. So now I'm at the Athletic, whereby they, they've gone for a subscriber model, so people are paying a modest fee to access the content. Uh, Reach PLC on NCG Media, who produced the Chronicle and Journal, they've gone for a different model, whereby it's it's basically you get all the content for free, but the journalism needs to be paid for in some way. And so there's adverts, there's adverts on the videos, and I know how frustrating that is, but... At the end of the day, if you want paid journalists, there needs to be a way for that to be financed. And uh, so, but as I say, I wasn't actively looking to leave the Chronicle. I got approached, I got a new opportunity, and it just felt something fresh and new. And I hope the Chronicle goes from strength to strength. In terms of their relationship with the club, I was, I suppose you could say, fortunate in a way that I wasn't there during the time of the ban. That was just a few months before I was there. They were banned for, for more than a year. Um, and that was very difficult, I'm sure, for the reporters at the time, that they still had good contacts within the club and still were still able to get around that. But in terms of access, it was difficult. There have been difficult times over the last few years. But the last few months of Rafa Benitez's reign, I know that the club weren't very happy with what they saw as, as, as one-sided. A lot of the reporters being one-sided or too far to Rafa Benitez's side, and they didn't think it was portrayed fairly. It is very difficult as a local newspaper, a local news organisation, to have that balance. I think you've got to... I always look at it as you've got to be a sort of critical friend. You have to have that independence from the club. So if you, if you do get banned in some ways, you maintain that independence. But at the same time, I think that the relationship is, is mutually beneficial for fans and for the club. You need that independent media, medium to communicate between them. I don't think that that balance is quite there at the moment. Hopefully it will get there in time. It's better than it has been in the past. It's not the best. It has been in the past as well. It's in a sort of tricky stage and I just hope that in the next few weeks, months and years that that improves because it, it's so important for the fans that they do have the local media to be able to access and for the, for the relationship with the club to be there. Definitely and you got the Athletic now, you just mentioned obviously it's a subscriber base that you've got to pay a little like a modest fee as you said to access the um, articles but for anyone that doesn't know what the Athletic is or what they what they try and do? Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on what they what they're trying to do? Yeah, so the Athletic launched in the US about three years ago, and initially they focused on uh, baseball and also ice hockey, and they saw a sort of gap in the market as as they thought it was for reporting on those. So in America, they were sort of the, the smaller sports below American football and basketball, and a lot of reporters were being let go of, and so they saw a niche in that regard, and they also decided they wanted a bit more long read in depth sort of report and over time they've built up they've, they've moved in I think they're in 70 odd cities across the US and Canada they've added uh, basketball they've added American football and added boxing golf various other sports and as of four weeks ago three and a half four weeks ago they've launched in the UK covering Premier League football championship football Scottish football and so it's uh, theathletic.co.uk or theathletic.com 
for that, what they're trying to do is is offer a different form of, of, of covering football in England and to complement what's already out there with more long reads, more in-depth. So there isn't going to be as high a volume, so you're not going to get necessarily the manager's quotes every week from a press conference or whatnot. But my job is to try and delve a little bit deeper, find something a little bit different about what's going on in Newcastle, provide analysis of that. So I'm covering Newcastle full-time for them as a full-time reporter at every single Premier League club and some of the bigger championship clubs. George Colgan uh, is joining very soon from the Times. That they've gone for a lot of other uh, national reporters, the likes of Oliver Kay. And So hopefully it's just going to be a new uh, medium for, for which supporters can access what they love about Newcastle and elsewhere. And for subscribing, you also get all the American content. So if you're in the US sports, um, then you can look at what's happening in the baseball and in the basketball or whatever as well. It seems to be something that's changing. And I think that's this is my final question I have to say on this one. How much has this industry changed in just maybe in the last five years? And do you think that in the next five years, it's just going to even change even more? And that's something that we've not even thought of is going to be the big thing. Well, even in the five, yeah, even the five, six years I've been in the industry, it's changed dramatically. So rather than just being print first as it was in the past, where you'd be thinking about newspapers, when I was at uh, the Chronicle, it was it, we were digital first operation, and by, by that it was we were writing initially for online and for the for the web and mobile, and then the content will be changed for print and, and, and developed for that. And and you have multimedia platforms now. You have video, which is so important for, for so many reasons because people want to watch it and also because it generates higher advertising for uh, the likes of local newspapers and whatnot. You have podcasts, you have radio stations, you have everything. It, it, it very much is a multimedia platform. People are consuming news in different ways. People are going online rather than buying a newspaper. They're, they're, they're watching it on the mobile rather than on desktop. I think it will change dramatically over the next five or six years as well. I think, I mean, I hope, <laughs> biased, I hope that it does start to change more towards the subscription-based model or that people will consume more from websites. And so I think that over the next few years, we will see more of that. Podcasts are booming at the moment, videos, and I think that that is the direction we're going to keep heading in. And in five or six years' time, if we look back to where we are now, I think it will look significantly different. No, oh, definitely so. Uh, Rob, have you got any last questions before we get on to the break? Uh, no, uh, you, you've touched upon everything that uh, I was wanting to, to bring up. Oh, fantastic. Well, yeah. in part five, it's going to be a Q&A with Chris about anything to do with Newcastle. If you want to get any last-minute questions, get us uh, get it on online. We've got, obviously, the YouTube, we've got the chats and, uh, and all of our social media platforms as well. If you want to get any last-minute questions, you've got three minutes roughly to do so. We'll see you in the final part of the Black and White Show.
final part of the Black White Show here on Over Radio North East 102.5 FM. This is the Q&A with Chris Woff, the athletic reporter, or what's the official title? Reporter, type? writer, or whatever you like. Whatever you like. I was, I was going to go with reporter. It sounds bad, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first question is from Richard Boyd, uh, Chris, and it's, was Rafa pushed? Or was he never going to stay stay and knock back a big payday? So it's obviously Rafa Benitez leaving at the end of the season it was very very difficult to take for some report. Uh, so I was going to say for some fans, and obviously you've seen the attendance yesterday. How close was Rafa Benitez signing a new deal, and was he ever going to sign a new deal? Well, I think that it shifted quite a lot last season, it, back and forth. So I think it got to about April, and at that point, Benitez in his mind had decided he was going to leave, but then there was sort of some positive conversations between him and the club hierarchy. And after the Fulham game and the immediate aftermath of that, before the meeting they had the Thursday afterwards, I think everyone at Newcastle United thought that Benitez was going to stay. He went to that meeting thinking he was going to stay. Newcastle thought he was going to stay. Ashley thought he was going to stay at Charnley. And then the meeting, when they got there, the, I think the, what was presented to Benitez was not what he expected to hear. He left that meeting hoping to hear back more from Newcastle have more concessions which never arrived and basically trust had just broken down to such an extent that I think by the last two three weeks of June there was there was no way that the relationship could go forward in terms of Newcastle wanted him to sign a longer contract Benitez wanted just a year because he wasn't convinced that the promises were going to be met and so was he pushed I don't think it, it was pushed in the case that look Newcastle are insistent that they wanted him to stay and I think that they did want him to stay but they wanted him to stay under the terms of how they wanted the club to be run and Benitez couldn't accept that he got a very lucrative offer, lucrative offer from China Rafa Benitez by the way just to mention is also uh, a columnist for The Athletic um, and he did a Q&A the other day so you, you can't find his opinions uh, on The Athletic going forward but just in terms of uh, what he thought he mentioned this in his first column that basically it, he doesn't he doesn't pretend that he didn't go to China partly for the money but he also sees it as being a project in, in his view I know a lot of people raise their eyebrows I do raise my eyebrows to a certain extent because I think that Benitez going to China diminishes Newcastle and it also diminishes him personally he needs to be in the Premier League he needs to be at a big club but the offers weren't forthcoming. He decided to go to China for a significant payday for a club who are investing a lot of money in the training ground and a lot of money in their squad. He did not see Newcastle breaking into the top eight, top ten as he wanted and challenging for trophies. And so that's why we were left with a situation whereby Newcastle was scrambling around trying to get a new manager by the end of June. So Paul's kind of mentioned in the comments um, about the, a potential foreign takeover. There was obviously a lot of headlines in regards to a potential takeover. Did that have any impact on Rafa staying or going or what he was hearing from the football club? And was there ever a takeover in in the offing, really? Well, the lack of clarity certainly didn't help the situation. Benitez has referenced this a few times himself. He did an interview with the Times. He mentioned it, I think, in his blog. And he also mentioned it uh, in his column for The Athletic that, that essentially, once the news broke that supposedly the Ben Zayed group were close to buying the club, that he tried to seek answers and didn't get the clarification that he wanted. Now, we found that as frustrating as anyone covering the club over the summer because there were these outlandish claims coming from the Bin Zayed group, but we couldn't get them stood up in any way, shape or form on the, the British side. Look, they, they did sign a head of terms agreement with Meg Ashley, but essentially all that does is, is say that we are willing to pay X amount for, for the club. It, it isn't a contract, it isn't, it isn't a sale of the club. And they kept on coming out and saying that there were in the... Uh, Premier League fit and proper persons test. My understanding is that never begun. They never provided all the information that they needed for that. I think that the club were always sceptical as to about whether, whether they had the money, but the club didn't come out and clarify. They didn't knock down anything that was being said, and it added to the confusion that was happening on Tyneside. There have been other bids, and my understanding is there, there are still interested parties in and behind the scenes, but as we found over the last three or four years, the difference between an interested party and actually buying Newcastle United completely different, and I think if and when Newcastle is sold, it's going to just happen and we will just find out about it the day after. Now, as a reporter, it's probably not clear for me to admit that because I'm basically saying I'm not going to get the story before it happens. But I think we've reached a point where Newcastle United need new ownership and if it if it takes that for it to happen, then great. I hope it does happen in the medium to short term. Mike Ashley gave that alarming interview with the Daily Mail where he said he could see himself being owner forever, which I'm sure the vast majority of Newcastle fans certainly don't want, and let's hope that in the, the, the not-too-distant future, 
that does happen. I think that we're unlikely to hear too much more on the takeover front until the winter, because at the moment Newcastle's Premier League future is in doubt. Uh, just given the fact that the new season started, they're, they've got four points in four games, but there's question marks over the squad. I always think it's more likely a takeover is going to happen during the summer, so I think it's going to be a few months yet until we hear any more on that. Definitely. Lee, there was a question from uh, Brandon about playing two men up front against Liverpool. Who were those two men that he wants to play up front? <laughs> Andy Carroll. I don't think Andy Carroll will start. And Joe Linton. Will we play 5-3-2? Is it possible to work out with both our number nines on top? I think he's referring to number nines as, as in the old traditional number nines. I kind of see Carroll starting. Bit it's a bit risky against Liverpool to play five. Well, well not I think I, I think those two up top is a bit. I think what will be and Chris will probably agree with this. I think having Andy Carroll on the bench will be a lift to the supporters on the first team. And if he does make it, it's at Anfield, ironically as well, somewhere we want to do well. Chris, with Andy Carroll, and this is just a personal question for myself. Did do you think when he left, he wanted to leave, or do you feel that like he was just forced out of the club at the time? I don't. I wouldn't use necessarily the term forced. I think it was. I don't think he was pushing to leave. I don't think he wanted to go in that sense. But I think that the financial offer was so big that the club didn't want to turn it down. And then Carroll, once it came to that, and he realised he was going to quadruple his salary or whatever it was that he got, and realised it was the opportunity to go to Liverpool, who at the time seemed to be pushing on, and subsequently did. That yes, I think it was more the club want wanting to accept that offer and let him go rather than him pushing to leave but at the same time it wasn't as if he was frog marched out in that sense I do think that he would have preferred to stay if possible but he got an opportunity to go elsewhere it hasn't worked out for him he's now back referencing the question do I see him going and do I see Steve Bruce playing the two up top away at Liverpool no I don't I mean I'm, I'm, I'm still the noises I'm hearing I'm not 100% sure that Andy Carroll is going to be quite ready by then I hope he is and he, he is pushing to be but Newcastle don't want to take any risks on too soon. We know he's had so many injuries over the last three, four, five, six years that he can't, if Newcastle push him back early, that could be the majority of the season he's out for. They, they need to make sure his body's right and he's physically ready to do so. At some point, I will be interested to see him and Joe Linton up front together, though, because I think that although Joe Linton's performed more of a lone striker role at holding the ball up, he has pace and he has played a bit further out wide in Hoffenheim, and I think that he could be a decent foil and him and Carroll could cause... Opposition defence has a few problems. Well, we got we got him on a permanent. He's not a lone striker. Oh, <laughs> oh God. That's terrible. That's the first one. We've got 15 minutes or so left, and you've got all the way there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just going back on to Rafa, uh, Chris, I know this is this last bit maybe for you for this Q&A, but two questions that have kind of been put together. Who was the club's first choice to replace Rafa Benitez when they found out he was going to leave? And where was Bruce on that list? I suppose this is referencing the, the claims. I think it was was it on Sky Sports before the game where it was just it was just announced that it was just during the, one of the pre, uh, preseason friendlies where they just said he was eleventh choice. Is that when yeah, that actually came? I, I think it, I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but uh, I, I think that was the claim, and it was. I think it was from Sky. But if it's wrong, we we, are, we do apologise. But I think I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, anyway, that that's the first I heard of it on, on that program. I remember sitting there watching it, but. He certainly, Bruce certainly wasn't that far down the list. I mean, I know that he was he was in consideration. He was he was someone who Newcastle have had in their thoughts before when they when they previously appointed managers. I think he was in in their thoughts before Steve McLaren. He's someone they like. They've, they've spoken a lot about the fact that he's a Geordie and that he brings that to the table. Um, and his passion it, it is quite obvious now. That isn't and shouldn't be the only qualification for any position or any job. But um, I think that that that, that, that has helped him to a certain degree. And he needs to be given time, in my opinion. I understand all the reservations, but anyone who's going to follow Benitez was going to have a difficult job. Who Newcastle's first choice was, now I know they looked at Patrick Vieira, they were very keen on Patrick Vieira. The same with Miguel Arteta, the assistant manager at Manchester City. I think talks got quite reasonably far advanced with Arteta's people, and I think that there was a stage where he, he may, was maybe considering it, but it never got to the stage where it was, that he was imminent and that he was going to be appointed. And so Newcastle... That, that's what I don't really understand about when Newcastle did the summer. They, they initially went for sort of young European forward thinking manager and then they've reverted to to Steve Bruce. Now I don't mean that I don't mean that derogatory term and I know some Newcastle fans are probably gonna be sitting there smoking. I mean that in the sense that he isn't that sort of manager. The problem I had with going for someone like Bruce, so if he'd have gone for a bit or Marnos or anyone like that, is that 
they, there are biases that Newcastle fans and Premier League fans are already going to have because they've already managed in the Premier League before. So if Roberto Martinez had come in, for example, if Newcastle had gone to Norwich and lost 3-1, we would have been talking about the fact that he couldn't, he couldn't set up a defence at Everton. Someone like Arteta, someone like Vieira, I think would have been given more time by fans for that. And I think he would have got the same if they'd gone for someone like Giovanni Van Bronckhorst. They did look at that sort of European model, but in the end, I think Bruce was probably third, fourth-ish on the list. He was sort of the backup to the first couple of choices if they couldn't get them. Steve Bruce is someone we think is, quote-unquote, a safe pair of hands. I know a lot of Newcastle fans have had issue with that phrase because I think he, he, he's taken teams down before. But in general, he's done a reasonable job at most clubs that he's been at. Yeah, I think it's fair to say he did a very, very good job at Hull. Um, getting to an FA Cup final when the Newcastle last get to an FA Cup final I think we were still in the ni- 1990s I think 99 99 yeah. where you, Rob was there in an instant yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, no, no I, was, I was only like three going on four at the time so, so, so I wasn't there so <laughs> 2 0 defeating Man U <laughs> yeah, because Sheringham came on yeah. after 10 minutes scored yeah. talking about Manchester United were they close to getting Sean Longstaff or was it ever really close at all the, the Sean Longstaff situation of the summer was really strange because Clearly, journalists across Manchester were being briefed by the Manchester United side that a bid was going to be made for Sean Longstaff, that they were confident it was going to happen. And Newcastle never never actually received an official bid. They had they received an approach at one stage, an inquiry, but this was weeks after the initial stage it was going to happen. And basically, they came to Newcastle and were saying, look how much are you willing to sell for? Thinking they could get him for 20, 25 million. And Newcastle just said, well, we wouldn't even consider it unless it's, it's more than 50 million. And Man United seemed quite offended by that. Now, I, I realise he only has nine or ten Premier League appearances to, to his name at this stage, and I can see why Man United think that's an outrageous price. But there was almost an arrogance about the way Man United approached it, and I think that they were naive, thinking, and to be fair, Newcastle stuck the gun and said, look, unless you come near our asking price, we don't need to sell them, we don't want to sell them. He's our youth product. We think we can build a team around him, and Newcastle got criticised for a lot, and have been criticised for a lot over the last few months. But they have kept short long stuff. They didn't just blink because Man United came and offered them twenty million or whatever. They said, "This is our price. If you don't meet us, we want to keep him. We don't really want to sell him." I think, I think, I think it's, it's actually refreshing to hear. Believe that not from, <laughs> from Newcastle. I didn't think they ever say that. But hey ho, talking about signings. Obviously, they brought in Alan St. Maximan. They brought in Andy Carroll, Joe Linton. Emil Kraft, um, obviously a few academy players as well. Was there anybody else that Newcastle were pretty close to that you can reveal, or maybe ones that you're thinking, well, they were knocking on the door, they were they had legs. In, you had the heads turned, maybe? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the obvious one is, I mean, Salomon Rondon, if, if Benitez had stayed, then Salomon Rondon would likely have stayed because Benitez wanted him and, and he wanted uh, to, to be able to build a forward line alongside Rondon after what he did last season he was keen on keeping him other positions Newcastle did look at quite a few wing backs and, and, and Stanley and Socky someone at PSG they've looked at for a long while I believe he's just gone somewhere else coming exactly where he's signed but he is someone who at one stage in the summer I think Newcastle thought that deal was going to happen but for whatever reason it, it didn't they didn't bring him uh, to Townside and instead they, they've, they've gone for Jetro Villams who's someone that they've looked at long term but has had a few injury problems was played a lot in midfield, actually, Bruce Emmanuel Glabat last season. One of the reasons he was keen to come to Newcastle was to shift back to that left wing back position. Up front, uh, there were a few young names from from, from on the continent of Newcastle looked at. I know Wesley was someone uh, who was subsequently signed for Aston Villa. Benitez had had conversations, or he had, had conversations with people in and around Wesley and liked him. And if Benitez had stayed, I think he's someone Newcastle may have explored the possibility of signing. And he, he's gone to Villa scored uh, during, during their first win. It looks like he's got something about him, but it, he, he was a younger sort of striker alongside the, the Joel Linton mode. I don't think Newcastle would have signed both, but uh, going forward, I think that that seems to be the model Newcastle are going for. They've gone back to the sort of under-25 policy of players with potential sell-on value who they think they can get money for. Joel Linton is an interesting one because I do think he's got something about him, but to spend £40 million on him, he's really going to have to... To, to do well for Newcastle if they do think is, he's going to appreciate in value to such a significant extent because 40 million is already a significant outlay he's going to have to to really excel and he seems to have all the component parts to be able to do so but in that ex- inexperienced forward line in a, in a team that's likely to be in and around the bottom half of the Premier League it's a very difficult job for him this season Question for that on top of that uh, yeah. you mentioned Joel Linton there Chris 
was he signed behind Benitez's back or the plans in motion were sign, signing him without him knowing? Well, Benitez was was in conversations around, surrounding Joe Linton being one of the targets. Newcastle had the opportunity to potentially sign him in January. The, at the time, I think the price, they thought the price was a bit high and the deal did not happen. Bruce uh, Benitez, sorry, liked a lot of what Joe Linton had to offer, but I think he thought he was worth closer to the 20 million mark rather than the 40 million mark. Now, I think that Benitez's eyebrows were raised a little bit when Newcastle, when Ashley basically came out and said that the Joe Linton deal was done in, in February, and I, I think Charlie said something similar. And he, I think he was he was a little bit perturbed by that because at the time he had the first say on the final say, sorry, on transfers. So how it could have happened without him, I'm not really sure. It, it, it's 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 a bit of tit for tat. I think that Benitez liked him, as I said, and I think that he, he would have potentially sanctioned a deal for him if it was a lower price and if he could have got Rondon as well. But I don't think Newcastle would have signed Joe Linton for forty million if Benitez was still manager because I don't think Benitez wanted to use that much of the budget on him. Definitely, I think that's a, I think that's a fair point. I think one question that we want to speak on is about your opinion on fan channels. Obviously, obviously, we're one of the biggest fan channels for, New, for Newcastle, and you know, we, there are other other fan channels with Newcastle. It's the same with every single football club now. Do you like them? Do you respect them? Or do you feel that they, it's a, it's it's, it's a hindrance? Yeah, the, a hindrance. I think that's probably the correct way. I was trying to think that I know it's appropriate, but I think maybe a hindrance is probably the best one we can think of right now. What do you mean by hindrance? Um, Show the club yeah, in a bad light. Like yeah. Arsenal fan TV have got a lot of bad stick and a club didn't want them to use the Arsenal actually in their channel name. So that revert back to EFTV um, because they have a lot of controversial characters and the club didn't want nothing to associate with that. Right, I see you mean. I mean, I, I, I do watch some fan channels and I, I, partly I do that because as a journalist, I like to try and... S- see as much of the opinion that's out there from supporters and try and think about how I can answer as many of the questions that they have as possible. And so I, I think there is a, a real value to them. I think there's there's a... As a journalist, when I speak to some fans, I think that sometimes, because I am a journalist approaching them, sometimes they're not as open as maybe they can be. Sometimes you don't get those opinions where there's something almost more organic if it's a if it's a fan-run channel that you get opinions that maybe I couldn't necessarily extract as easily myself speaking to people. So I think that there is a value in that sense. When it comes to Arsenal TV, yes, I can see why uh, why Arsenal would, would not want their name necessarily associated with that. I know there's been a fair few controversies to do with that. So I think that I think there has to be a happy medium with them. I think that it, it, it isn't ever going to be a professional outfit. There needs to be something a bit more, um, not amateurish, but just, something, just because it is fan-led, it needs to have that humour about it. It needs to have the raw motion, the all of that with it but at the same time I think there is a line you don't necessarily want to cross because then it becomes uh, it can become damaging to, to the reputation of both the club and the supporters of that club so just because something's called Arsenal fan TV that doesn't mean that every single Arsenal fan is similar to that And then, so yeah I think there's a happy medium but I certainly think there is a place and I can only see them getting bigger going forward because they are very popular and they only just seem to be growing and growing so yeah. one thing sorry Johnny that's the one thing I would agree on is that You've got several of different fan groups. You've got like Truth Faith, like the podcast, really, really popular with podcasts. You've got us like on YouTube, and etc. There's several are out there as well. And the one thing that we always stress is that we don't speak for, you know, him or her. We have a group of nine people who speak for those nine people. But that's probably what you were saying earlier on, Chris, is that the how the how the media is now growing in the digital world. You'll be, I think, you'll see more and more of this kind of stuff because it's in everyone's home now. All you need is a mobile phone with a good mic and you're, you're away, aren't you? It's, it's very, very easy, um, to be brutally honest with you. And I think, look, I think it's it does get a lot of bad press, but I think in recent times with us, we don't get as much bad press, which is... Well, we raise money for charity. Yeah, we, we, do, we try and do the right things. And look, sometimes we're maybe a bit controversial in a couple of things that we've said, but we only do it because of the, it's the passion. And I think everyone, even like a fan yourself, I think, I think if you probably were working for a company for Newcastle, if you were going to the games yourself, you might be saying... Stuff from the heart without maybe writing it down for stuff you can't say on exactly. the exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's part that's part of what football and sport is about. It is it is that passion and and you get that from fans that you don't. It, it is a different medium in that sense that I can't necessarily do that in the sense that when I'm writing, I was trying to disassociate myself in that sense and, and try to to remove a little bit of of that passion. But as a fan, that that's what you bring. That's what that's what fans TV. That's what 
fans channels fan blogs all of the fanzines that's what they bring that, that is different and, and and other supporters of the fans love some love that some hate it some some like reading it some like complaining about it that that's just all part and parcel of what is isn't around in, in the medium and i think that there is a space for it and it, it, it's just about finding that happy medium and just finally chris i think this is probably the, 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 the easiest question and i probably the last question when you're possibly going to finish this season Oh, uh, <laughs> right. Well, that, that is it. That's a question. I mean, we spoke earlier, and I said that I thought that four points from four games w- was about par. I-, I think it will be a long season. I think that Newcastle are going to be there or thereabouts when it comes to being in the bottom, say eight. I hope that if they can pick up a bit of momentum and have a good January transfer, we know that maybe they prove me wrong and that they do finish slightly higher. But my concern is that up front, I think they lack goals, I think, in proven Premier League goals. They've, they've signed some players with really good potential. I, I really like a lot of what Joel Litton offers. I still think Almiron can come good and, and does bring something different. Sam Maximan has something about him. Atsu, hopefully, is going to start to prove it, but none of them are proven Premier League goal scorers. And until someone starts scoring consistently, there's my concern for Newcastle. Defensively, they have some very good players, but a very good goalkeeper. Got a bit of depth in midfield. But I think that it's going to be a case of it's going to probably there's going to be some tests and times throughout the season and I would if you pushed me to, to pick a position I'm going to say probably 14th 15th maybe one or two places lower than last season 14th 15th means you're going to stay up again that's alright isn't it I'll, <laughs> I'll take that I'll take that yeah definitely just to recap just out before we say do our goodbyes and everything that um, it finished today in the Premier League Everton 3 Wolves 2 Alex will be getting on the score sheet but it was with Charleston getting two for Everton getting the winner 10 minutes from the end. Uh, finished in the North London derby, Arsenal 2, Tottenham 2. Tottenham went 2 0 through Christian Eriksen and Harry King from the penalty spot. Like I said, pulled one back just before half time, but Pierre yeah, Emmerich finally had scored. With about 15 minutes to go to give Arsenal a point, and it also finished in the Old Firm derby, Rangers 0, Celtic 2. Celtic have a three point gap at the top, which means that. Oh, who cares? That's who a Mickey Mouse league. That. They're probably, they're probably, they're probably going to be winning the league already now. That's what I said. First of September, you may as well give them the trophy. My thanks to Rob Spearman. My thanks to Lee Lawler. And a big thanks to the Athletics, Chris Woff. Hope you enjoyed the show. I did, not any time. And okay. Hopefully, I'll have you back sometime later on in the season. We'll be back next week. This is International Break, but we'll still have plenty to talk about with Newcastle United. And I'm sure we might even touch about England as well. But So, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week.